My name is Tony Simons and I'm the Director General of ICRAF and the Executive Director of C4 ICRAF. COP26, because of COVID, has been different to the previous COPs. Um, it's been postponed a year. We didn't know really the format that would be, how much in-person and how much virtual it would be. And therefore the planning has been a bit more difficult. But it's amazing to see the interest for our work and the inclusion in the agenda, particularly of forestry. So on Tuesday the 2nd of November, it was a historic declaration. 110 world leaders signed up to a declaration. Yes, it's not legally binding. However, it is significant. Significant because it has a substantial amount of finance associated with it. It is not an empty pledge. It's not an empty commitment. And it must rank as the most or amongst the most significant announcements on forestry ever. Forestry hit the world stage, if you like, in 1948 when FAO included it as part of its agenda. And FAO has done a fantastic job in, in, in shepherding forestry and keeping it alive in the international agenda. But, but look back to the 1972 Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment not a single mention of forest. Look, jump forward 20 years to 1992 to Rio, not a single mention of forest in that declaration. Forestry was meant to have its own framework convention, it missed out. It was great in 2000 when we created the United Nations Forum on Forests. However, that has been underfunded and doesn't get the attention that it deserves. We saw a declaration in 2014 in New York but there was only 40 countries signed up to it. It's non-legally binding. There were targets, 10 goals. However, there was no uh, much impetus in relation to that. And it was largely about um, commodities and supply chains being affected by deforestation. So this is a much more comprehensive uh, declaration. It covers protecting natural forests for the first time rather than rewarding the bad individuals who are doing, being a little bit less bad with avoided deforestation, it's bringing everything together. Protecting the existing forest stock that we have, the 400 billion or gigatons of carbon that it contains, as well as helping restore agricultural land with trees and having increased removals through tree planting. Well, I think COP26, particularly with the uh, civil society and the youth and the activist groups, are making these COPs and the commitments that are being made by countries, if they're not legally binding, they've got to be now morally binding. This is a change. This is people being held to account for the promises that they're making. And we see that around the $100 billion pledge for climate action and climate financing. And this forest declaration is not going to be able to slide by as previous ones have that have been failed or missed targets. This is going to be something where they will have to stand at world leaders and private sector and the financiers that are putting their voice and power and uh, resources behind this to actually make things happen. It is great to see an increased attention being paid to nature, to ecology, to understanding the connectivity between forest, biodiversity, climate, agriculture, water, human prosperity. However, we've got to be careful that we don't just rely on, on, on words. So we have a prol proliferation of things at the moment. Ecosystem-based adaptation, eco-agriculture, agroecology, regenerative agriculture, nature-based solutions, nature positive, net zero. And the, the um, fulfilling and rewarding aspect of all of that to us is that when we have fields like agroforestry and forestry, they have a huge body of literature behind them. 
They have well-established definitions, well-established principles, well-established bodies of literature on them and training and degrees and resources. So we are well positioned to assist all of those things. What we certainly don't want is to see a division between them. So we need to have that, that universal Venn diagram where we're looking at the relationship between regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based adaptation so that we can meet the goals of the, the decade on ecological restoration and all of the other legitimate and worthy initiatives that are being come up but where we're trying to get away from just ownership of a term or ownership of a label. There is a danger when forests are equated to carbon and we've seen that in the past and the, particularly when carbon is at a very low price. Forests are so much more than carbon and we've got to make sure that also forests are not being used as an excuse not to reduce fossil fuel emissions. That is the, not the big elephant in the room, that is the big Noah's Ark in the room. That is 34 a billion tons a year of fossil fuel emissions. And when you think all of the world's forests and 4.1 billion hectares of land contain about 400 billion tons of carbon, we've got to be very careful that those emissions don't outweigh that incredible sink that we have. And it's not just a sink of carbon, it's water regulation, it's ecological functioning, it's provision of goods and services. The declaration made on Tuesday was about forests and land use and agriculture and forests together about two-thirds of the world's land and here the connection between agriculture and forest, natural forests, planted forests, um, uh, even mangrove forests is incredible because what it will allow us to do is to explore and, and look at those synergies and linkages between agriculture. Thinking about increasing the perennial dimensions in the agriculture through field boundary plantings, through block planting, through fruit timber medicinal trees, through trees that can increase carbon in the soil to make that soil more responsive, more productive and give us this circular regenerative agriculture that the world needs and now is demanding. COP26 has been the one where finance has really enhanced incredibly its role in linking up and increasing climate action. And it's great to see corporates and private investors coming here to, to back and to look at these new investments around financial viability, uh, technical feasibility, social acceptability, operational deliverability, and m importantly, environmental sustainability. So the demand for the work of C4 ICRAF, Resilient Landscapes, the Global Landscape Forum, is going to mushroom around the initiatives that have been started these two weeks.